Welcome to Fayetteville Community Church. We welcome our church family and our visiting friends. Thank you for coming to worship with us. To find out more about our church, upcoming events, and other church activities, you may visit us online at www.fccnc.us. This week, um, I, I said a minute ago when I was talking to the kids, this is, it's, this is Holy Week for us as Christians because everything that we do and everything that we are and everything that we believe and everything that we preach gets its validation from this week. It gets, we are valid as a religion because of what happens this week. Because we serve Jesus Christ. We serve Jesus Christ who came. He came to earth as a man. He was rejected by his own people. They put him on a cross. They put nails in his hands. But then he went into the tomb and he rose victorious. And that's what we celebrate through this week of Easter, through Good Friday, through Palm Sunday, which is today, we celebrate the life and the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Now, what I'm going to talk to you about this morning basically comes out of, of one verse of Scripture, and that's the second chapter of Corinthians. In the, uh, uh, second Corinthians, I'm sorry, chapter 5. So if you want to turn to that and have that, you can have, kind of have that ready. Um, how many of you know who Donald Trump is? He's got, he's a gazillionaire, billionaire, and got gorgeous hair. I mean, we just love all those things about him. I mean, what, what could not be great, Jay, to have a lot of money and a lot of hair? I mean, go figure. It would just be a blessing, wouldn't it? But Donald, Donald Trump says this. He said, there's nothing like the art of a deal. There's nothing like the art of a deal. Now, I, I love watching like um, um, American Pickers. Or any of those shows like on the Discovery Channel where they, they're like dickering back and forth. And, and they go in and they try to find something that's, that's worth a little bit down the road. And, and they, they dicker some. Any of you guys enjoy doing that? How many of you are flea market junkies and love John Stanford? You and Lisa need to stand up and turn flips. Because y'all, they, they like look in the paper, look for antique sales, estate sales. I mean, Lisa, she is a junkie for that stuff. I mean, they, they do it all the time. But we all love finding something for nothing and then finding that that nothing is worth something. Can you say amen? I mean, how wonderful would it be to go into an attic somewhere and find something that was just unbelievably valuable? And you'd be able to sell it and pay off your debt and all your kids' debt and whatever. That's just the deal right there, isn't it, TJ? (laughs) Well... How many of you remember making a great deal ever in your life? Claude, you remember that? Making a great deal. There's one deal that was made in 1626. Don't you look at this deal real quick. And a guy named Peter Minuit bought, he bought this. He bought Manhattan Island. He bought the island of Manhattan. Y'all know where Manhattan is? New York City, Manhattan. Okay. He bought it from the Indians that were there. He bought it for a load of cloth, beads, some hatchets, a few trinkets. And actually, he bought the whole island of Manhattan, which is right there, for 60 Dutch guilders, which that equals up to a pound and a half of silver, which 12 ounces to the pound at that time was about $4 per troy ounce. And so in today's terms, he bought all of Manhattan Island for about $72. And today, the island of Manhattan is worth $47 billion. When he bought it, he paid a half a cent an acre. And today, it's worth $827,000 an acre. Now, to say that he had a return on his investment is an understatement. Those of you that are math whizzes, do you know what kind of return on your investment that is? A lot. (laughs) Amen. It's 17 billion percent. A return on your investment. James, that's good investment right there. I don't care care who you work for. It's good investment right there. 17 billion percent increase. 
I don't know about you, but I think that was a brilliant exchange. A brilliant exchange. Now, sometimes we don't always get the best end of the deal. We, we have things that, that aren't the best end. And, and I'll, let me tell you a quick story. This guy, this guy was coming, coming to the pearly gates, and St. Peter was there waiting for him. And St. Peter said, let me ask you a question, buddy. He said, what, should, what did you do that I should let you through these gates? And the guy said, well, I was taking a trip out west, and I came upon this band of tough bikers. And I, don't, I, don't even, I don't see Pete here this morning, so I can't use Pete for an example. Are you here, Pete? Pete, this guy was out west, and he came out upon <laughs> this group of tough bikers. And they were harassing this woman. And they were threatening her. And it was the, the, the biggest, meanest guy in the whole, I mean, Pete's, Pete's scrawny, but he's mean. You get to see that? <laughs> right, Pete? He, he's got like pay up on his knuckles across there. But anyway, so he found the biggest, meanest guy, and he punched him right in the nose. And then he kicked over his bike, he yanked his ponytail, and he ripped out his nose ring. And then he looked at all the rest of the mean guys that were there with him, and he said this. He said, you'll leave this woman alone, or you got to answer to me. So pa St. Peter said, hey, you know what? I'm pretty impressed with all that. He said, when did all this happen to you? He said, about two minutes ago. <laughs> so, a brewing exchange. What are we going to do? We look at the cross and we see the cross, what it means to us, but today we're going to look at it in a little different term. We're going to look at it through God's eyes. Now, the cross is really, it's really God's way of saying this. Look at this. It's God's way of saying, I'm going to make you an offer that you, absolutely, that you cannot refuse. And it would absolutely make no sense to refuse. Now, if you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking, oh boy, another message about the cross. Another message about sin. And another message about what it takes to pay for my sin. Yes, it is. <laughs> Welcome to church. <laughs> now, the details, the details of this exchange are found in one simple verse of Scripture, and this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And it's simple. If you, look at this, if, if you look at this verse, it only has 23 words. 21 of the words are one syllables. One syllables. One has two syllables, one has three. So how can one verse so simple be everything that you're talking about it being this morning? Let me put it like this. There are 89 chapters in all the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In those are 3,779 verses and 64,000 words. And all of those words in those first four Gospels of the New Testament can be summarized in this one verse. Let's look at this. Why don't you read this with me? This is 2 Corinthians 5.21. Read it. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's my text this morning. What Christianity is all about, everything is a beautiful exchange. It's an exchange where God offers the one thing that we desperately need. The one thing in exchange for the only thing that we can give. And the result being the greatest miracle that we can ever experience. Now here's the key takeaway this morning if you want to have one thing. If you're only going to hear one thing, here you go. The beautiful exchange at the cross brings the greatest change through the cross. The beautiful exchange that took place at the cross brings the greatest change through the cross. Now what's amazing, what's amazing, and, and, and as you're going to learn about this, you're going to see this morning, the, the one thing that you think that you have to offer God, He doesn't really need. And he won't accept. The only thing that you do have to offer is the one thing that nobody would accept except God. U unless you make this deal on his terms, there's no deal. You're, you're, you're going to be amazed at how this beautiful exchange works this morning. And it's the most beautiful exchange that has ever taken place. So let's look. So number one, 
God offers his sinlessness. So we look at that verse, God offers his sinlessness. It says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. Now when Jesus came to the table, he offers the one thing that we desperately need that no other human being could offer. He offers sinlessness. Something happened on a Friday night 2,000 years ago that had never happened before and never can happen again. A person died who under ordinary circumstances never would. And the Bible says that what ultimately causes all people to die, look at this now, is not disease and not sickness and not illness and not bullets or bombs. What ultimately causes us all to die is one thing, sin. Because if we took away sin... Then you take away disease and sickness and illness and bullets and bombs. When God created Adam, look at this. He did not create Adam to die. He created him to live and to hang out with him. It wasn't until Adam sinned that the seed of death was planted in the human race. It wasn't until he sinned. Paul puts it like this. Look at this. This is Romans chapter 5 verse 12. He said, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. Paul's saying, hey, look, the reason it is like this is what our buddy did. He sinned, and it changed everything. The reason that everybody dies is because of what happened in the garden. Everyone in Adam has sinned. Can you say amen? Except for one. And what was his name? Jesus. And that verse tells us, the NIV says he had no sin. But it literally says he knew no sin. Not just that he had no sin. He didn't even knew it. He didn't even know it. The truth of the matter is, every one of us in this room have been acquainted at one time or another with sin. Can somebody say amen? amen? Sin's not only our worst enemy, and sometimes we make it our best friend. Sometimes we date sin, or we eat sin, or we live with sin, or we sleep with sin. Because truthfully, sometimes we enjoy sin. But Jesus never met sin. We talked about this in our um, study on, on Wednesday night of how Jesus came. Jesus Christ, look at this. He, sin was a complete stranger to him in the terms of experience, experiencing sin or attractiveness. And Jesus and sin never crossed paths, the Bible said, not ever one time. Could you imagine? Can you imagine a man like that? He knew all about it. He dealt with sin and dealt with sinners in, in, all, all through his ministry. But he never sinned. Think about it. Not one sinful word ever came out of his mouth. Have any of you had those this week at all? Anybody? Or one sinful thought ever passed through your mind? Or, or maybe not one sinful deed ever slipped from his hands. Everywhere he walked, he stepped into the dirt of sin. But he never got dirty with it. Now, but, now I'm, I'm, I'm building a case this morning for what I... What I want you to understand about this brilliant exchange. This beautiful exchange. Of all the billions of people who have ever lived on this planet or ever will, he's the only one who made a perfect score of 100 in the test of life. He's the only one. And because of sin and what we've gone through, every one of us deserved to die. But Jesus didn't have any sin. But yet, he came to die. And that's important because of this. Look at this. If Jesus had sinned, his death would have been deserved. And therefore, he could not have been a savior because one sinner can't die for the sins of another sinner. You see what that is? He couldn't. Because if he had died, if he had sinned, then his death would have been deserved. He would have been like all the rest of us. But he didn't. So therefore, he could not have ever been a savior because one sinner cannot die for the sins of another sinner. He gave the boldest challenge to anyone ever when he went to the Pharisees. He said, he, he, he told the Pharisees, they hated him. They, they spent their, their, their time trying to dig up dirt. They, they tried to catch him in a lie. They tried to find fault in him. And, and in John 8, 46, Jesus said, can any of you prove me guilty of sin? To which they ain't. no. Now I can promise you I would never, ever throw that gauntlet out to any of you especially with my wife around 
can any of you prove me guilty of sin? She'd be like, I could never throw that out, but Jesus could. And Pontius Pilate even looked at him and said, I find no fault in him. I can't find anything that this man did wrong. Even the thief, the thief that was beside him on the cross, he looked at him and said, this man has done nothing wrong worthy of death. Understand, he, he was not just sinless. Look at this. He was not just sinless as God, but he was sinless as a man. He was a carpenter. He was a man's man. He worked hard. And a carpenter in those days was not just like a carpenter in our days that worked with wood. They were craftsmen that worked with tile and all kind of different things. So they not only, and I guarantee at one time or another, John, he hit his thumb with a hammer. How many of you men have ever done that? And not one sinful word came out of your mouth. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Here's the thing, though. Only a man, look at this, only a man can die for the sins of another man. And only one who has never sinned can die for those who have. Only someone who came and deserved not to die can die for those who deserve to die. There's your brilliant and your beautiful exchange. That's why the cross was the greatest crime in the history of the world. It was the greatest because it took an absolute innocent man a man who deserved not to die and was put to death. Not only was he innocent man and was he mistreated, he was unfairly judged, he was brutalized, but also he was the sinless son of God. Yet it was there that day at the cross that the most unbelievable, beautiful exchange was made. Because it was the one thing that will kill you and me, our sin, is the one thing that killed him. That leads me to the next part. So number two, we offer our sinfulness. We offer our sin. Fullness, our sinfulness. Listen to those words again in 2 Corinthians 5 21. God who made God who made him had no sin to be sin for who? For us. For us. Now stay with me. Twelve one syllable words. Easy to read, but easy to blow through, easy to forget. But that's the staggering truth of all of what this is. And the two key words in that, I want you to say the last two words in that sentence again. Say it. For us. For us. It literally means in, in, in the place of. When you look at the cross, you see two things. His death and our sin. His death and our sins. Now stay with me. From the very beginning of the Bible to the end, the penalty of sin was death. We die because we're sinners and we sin. Jesus was not a sinner and he never sinned, but he died because of our sins. So therein, in other words, Jesus became our substitute. He was our propitiation. Right? All of you in our Grace Bible study, we learned what propitiation was. Oriana could never say it. She tried so hard. She has a college degree from Methodist University and never could say propitiation. So we'll continue to pray for her and that God bless her right now wherever she's at, Lord. We know she's at home, probably practicing it this morning. <laughs> Jesus became our substitute. Jesus Christ died on the cross, and he took your place and mine. An exchange was made. His nails, they were meant for us. Crown of thorns should have been on our heads. Spear should have pierced our side. You see, the, the cross is kind of a, you ever look through a kaleidoscope? It, you turn it one way, and you see sinlessness. You turn it another way and you see our sinfulness. You turn it another way and you see that sinlessness as a substitute for our sinfulness. You see what I'm saying? Are you with me this morning? Are you sleeping on me this morning? Stay with me. Because Sunday morning's coming and you're going to wake up. Someone, somebody put it this way and I love this. The essence of man, the essence, the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God. Look at that now. While the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. The essence of sin is man substituting himself. It's us getting, the way, getting in the way of where we should be. It's us and our sinful nature getting in the way of the way that we, we should be acting. 
It's us allowing the flesh to rule our spirit. But the essence of salvation and what God is doing is him substituting himself for man. It, it was not Jesus that was actually made a sinner because that would be impossible. He was made. God, God looked at Jesus and pronounced him guilty, not for his sin, for ours. He threatened him as if he had committed all the sins that we have ever done. And as Jesus hung on the cross bearing the sins of every person, beginning with Adam to the last person who will ever die... The Father poured every single ounce of his divine fury, look now, and his wrath on one that never deserved it, his son, Jesus. When you think about it, it's just as shocking that God the Father put on God the Son and then took on our guilt. Maybe you can relate to this. Maybe I can, I can put it better like this. Have you ever, any of you guys... Have you ever taken a magnifying glass, a magnifying glass, and taken it outside and like, like get it when the sun's shining really, really bright, and you you take it and you like you burn a blade of grass, or a leaf or something like that, and, and all of the energy of the sun is focused through that through that one little bitty glass that you got, and some of you kids are going, oh boy, this sounds like fun, and and then and then you do like me, and you have a mean streak in you, and you go find a worm. And, or an anthill, and I confess, I'm a worm murderer. I confess it. There was nothing in my life that I loved more than taking a magnifying glass and watching a worm just burst into flames. And that was the coolest thing. Was, just loved it. Get it all over your magnifying glass. It's the coolest thing ever. But you take all that energy and all that power that the sun has and you focus it through that one magnifying glass on that one worm and you just watch him explode. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's the same thing that God the Father, when he took a magnifying glass and he magnified all of the sins of the world and he focused them into one area and it was on the cross of Calvary and he began to burn our sins into his own son Jesus Christ and Jesus body exploded with the sin that we had one spot one individual, Jesus Christ. Kind of cool that I took a worm and turned it into that, huh? <laughs> now you'll begin to understand the exchange. God offered his son for me and you. And he burned him up for me and you. He offers the one thing that we need and needed and only he has. He offers the one thing that we have and we offer the one thing that we have and that he doesn't need, which is our sin and nobody wants. And he agrees for the beautiful exchange. Some of you are thinking about it this morning. Some of you are dealing with guilt right now where you're at. And let me tell you, today is a perfect time. Today is a perfect time to come and lay it all down and lay it all down so number three I'm almost finished God gives us his salvation the last part of this so that in him we might become the righteousness of God there's one thing that we need to come into the presence of God in this life and to the life of come you know what that is righteousness now our righteousness is as what the Bible says filthy rags no good it's absolutely no good but his righteousness, partial righteousness is not going to cut it. The one thing that we can't manufacture, righteousness, comes through this beautiful exchange. Martin Luther called it the great exchange. The only way that we can become any way righteous is through a beautiful exchange by receiving God's righteousness as a gift. Theologians, theologians have a great term for this. It's called imputation. It's a term that the banking world uses, and I, I want to show you this really quick. When you come to Jesus and trust him as the Lord and Savior of your life, look, your sinfulness is now credited to his account. His sinlessness is credit, credited to your account. All right? He takes the debt, he takes your debt, and we get his payment. 
He pays what we owed, what we never could pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And then he gives us what we could never earn. God no longer sees us as rebellious sinners, but he sees us as righteous sons and daughters. Put another way, he takes our guilt, we take his goodness, and as a result, we receive his grace. So one other question remains. How do we know, how do we know that we know that we know that God accepted Jesus' death as that payment? How do we know that God accepted Jesus as our substitute? How do we know that he really was sinless? And let me tell you how we know. The resurrection. The resurrection. Romans 4.25 says, He was delivered over death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. He was delivered over death for our sins and he was raised to life for our justification. If Jesus Christ is dead, then Christianity as we know it is dead. Isn't that right, Daddy? We have nothing to preach. If Jesus Christ is dead, then the deal is off. And apart from the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there's no sinlessness, there's no Savior, there's no salvation. Apart from the resurrection, Jesus was another a good man. But you see, a dead man doesn't offer any hope to our greatest problem. But the tomb was and is and forevermore, thank you, Jesus, empty. And at that moment, the beautiful exchange took place and we take the deal we take the deal that is offered as we receive Jesus Christ and we are justified what does justified mean I've heard daddy say it a million times the word justified means just if I'd never sinned just if I'd never done it I can tell you that the beautiful exchange at the cross is the greatest moment in my life but it's the tomb the empty tomb that sealed the deal that sealed the deal I'm going to close with this. If you're sitting at a table across from Jesus and he's offered his sinlessness as a sacri- and his sacrifice, and he asks you in return for your sinfulness, if you accept the deal, you'll gain the one thing that you must have to have a relationship with God and forever, now and forevermore, and that's righteousness. So you can remain neutral and kind of just stay where you are regarding the cross and the tomb. Let me tell you this this morning. The claim's too staggering. The event is too earth-shaking. The implications are too significant. The matter is too serious. And the deal's too great. And God's made his move for the exchange for your life. So what's yours this morning? What's your move? What are you going to do this morning? And I just believe there's some in here this morning. And what a wonderful time and a wonderful week. When somebody asks you, when did you turn your life over to Christ? So it was the week of Easter, 2015. Because for the first time in my life, I understood that everything that I had ever done was focused into one man's life. And that he gave everything he had. His life was destroyed because of me. bow your heads this morning Father we know that we can never be the same once we've heard the word and once we've heard the truth the responsibility is on us you tell us in your word Lord that my people perish for a lack of knowledge well I can tell you that we've told them the truth out of your word this morning Lord if anybody ever walks and says they never heard what a salvation message was and never heard what Jesus did for them, they can't say it after this day, Lord. So I thank you, Lord, for the word that has gone forth. And Father, I thank you for everyone that has come to the altar this morning that says, you know what, Lord? I'm trying to do as good as I can, but there's times that I just miss the mark. There's times that I don't do the things that I need to be doing, not just the things that I don't need to be doing. So, Lord, for every one of us in the house today, we just come to that place. We thank you for your grace, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for grace covering us from the top of our head to the sole of our feet. We thank you for giving us that, that we can attract, that we can run on, and we can carry on. And we thank you that your 
you're not waiting on us to mess up just to bash us but you're waiting there Lord with arms open up to love us in to gather us in to bring us in and God I thank you so much for what you did in sending your son because you knew when you sent your son for us you knew what he was getting himself into you knew the plan that had to be done you knew the sinless lamb that you had to send but today Lord we come to you and we just ask you Lord to forgive us of everything not just the, the thou shalt nots like James said but for the thou shalts that we're missing in our daily life Father so Lord I ask you that we can walk out of this place today loving you loving one another and striving with all that we can to get to a place where we receive what you have given us and Lord like we've said before grace was freely given but it cost somebody something and we know that cost was on Jesus. So Jesus, we come and we just want to thank you today for being willing to come and take the cup that you took for us. To take on the sins of all of us today, Lord. We just want to come and say, thank you, Jesus. Can you all say that? We can say, thank you, Jesus, for everything that you've done for me. I thank you for the beautiful exchange that took place for my life. In your name I pray, Lord. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you this week.